All right. Well, I've got Alex with me who has been from the minor leagues to Disney to UCF and, and all over. Uh, it's going to be fun hearing about his journey. Uh, but thanks for joining me, Alex. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, uh, this is the new, this is the new uh, modern day television, uh, the COVID Zoom calls and, uh, and podcasts, you know, we're all. They're we're taking all, over. That's they're it. They're taking over. I mean, I think everybody is bored like I am. And now everyone has got a podcast. Everybody's got something going on. But the cool thing is with the technology, it's so easy to do. It is easy to do. I mean, I remember the first time I did a Zoom call. Back in the old ages, about six months ago, I was nervous, right? <laughs> now it's like, boom, 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 boom. Where's my fancy background? <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's changed a lot. And, it, it, you know, stat on podcasts, because a lot of people are doing it. A lot of people ask if people should be doing it. I think you should. Everybody should be doing one if you have a story to tell. And yeah. there's 10 million bloggers in, in the United States doing blogs. There's only like 800,000 podcasters. So yeah, that so means we have a lot. 10%. So it lets you know, hey. If bloggers can do it, podcasters can do it, and I think, uh, you know, that some of them are really well created. Some of them just have really good content, and the average podcast uh, show lasts seven episodes. So I think you said you've done fifty, sixty. So you're 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 five hundred percent up, man. I see that? You're, you're I'm already, you know, leader. you're a market I, leader. I'm, my listeners are starting to go up, so I mean, it's uh, there's there's tens of people watching. <laughs> Uh, we we actually just hit maybe a week or two ago about 3,500 listens. Now right. that's that's you know over like 20 shows or whatever. But that's great. Um, but no, it's it's growing, and then we put it up on YouTube as well. But for me, what I love about it is I'm able to connect with a lot of cool people that maybe I haven't had the chance to talk to before. But yeah. COVID really started me out with. Hey, I'm going to just connect with at least one or two new people a week by phone. And that's kind of how the podcast started. Then I was like, well, let's put this on a podcast because yeah. there's some cool stories here. Yeah. Different and, backgrounds. And it's the modern networking, you know, for all of us who started in this business, it will always, it all was about networking and talking to people. Well, this is kind of the new way to network because you can't really, uh, you know, go to a basketball game and hang out in the press room and talk to people or, or talk to a sponsor in the suite or things like that. You don't have those. So this is kind of the, the new, the new normal, but uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I encourage students, uh, former colleagues that are trying to do, um, we're actually working, me and two partners are working on one, uh, a show. Uh, we've committed to doing two seasons. We haven't even done our first one and we're just working on what is it that we want? Cause there's so many things you could talk about. Oh yeah. And we don't want to just be all sports. We want to be, you know, giving back and paying for and things like that. So uh, I found a really cool studio in downtown that we're, we're going to contract with that uh, will give us uh, the best audio we can. Cause you know, you don't want to have to do anything. You know how hard it is just to get people oh, yeah. scheduled and you got to do the show and you got to edit it and you got to post it and you got to do your transcription yeah. and you got to do your social. That's a full-time gig, you know, but it's fun. It is work. I pay, I pay a kid to do all that for me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, these, these young guys, they, uh, they can do it so much faster. It's like, look, here's a hundred bucks. Do it. So there you go. Cool. No, oh, it's good. Him. So what's, so when's your show going to, going to launch? Uh, probably we're thinking right now, soft launch September 15. Okay. So we're, we, we decided to spend about a hundred days really researching it and immersing ourselves in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's going to really be storytelling, the evolution of people's careers. But we don't want it to be just uh, veteran people telling young people what to do. And it's really focusing on how everybody's life is a body of work, right? Yeah. And it's not just the job. Who you are is not the job you have. It's the body of work that you lead through this life. So, you know, whether you're a high school athlete graduating, wanting to get a scholarship, your high school work is done. Now the next chapter starts, the next story starts. If you're a graduating student, uh, graduating college, you want a job, you're no longer a student, you're now a full-time professional. If you've been in, working for 10 years and now you want to move on to something else, it's a new chapter. But the whole body of work is who and what you are. And how do you, how do you impart that on others 
who think they just want that one next one little step. It's much bigger than that. So that's what we're working on. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's, uh, it's a labor of love right now and a lot of work, yeah. but we're having fun at it. And I mean, that's how, that's how most of them start anyway. And it's yeah. like, you know, what you're passionate about, what, you know, there is an audience for every type of show out there. I mean, there, there's people that, uh, um, you know, are looking to be entertained and gain knowledge or, or whatever. So, I mean, if people will listen to my podcast, I mean, there's hope for anybody. <laughs> I was, I was at a session the other day with uh, some new friends and we were all getting to know each other. And I asked him what his show was about. And he said, anything but politics. And I went, that's a good title. And he, him, it, it, he goes, that is a good title, isn't it? Well, that's what he does. He talks about everything but because he's t- everybody's tired of talking about that. Yeah. I said, you got to change the name of your show, man. You got, you know, it's so you just stumble across those things. But yeah, it's, you know, it's it's fun. It's a good way to do it. I wish this was around 25, 30 years ago when I was a, a struggling broadcaster slash radio guy. It would have been, uh, you know, might have, might have taken a different course. You never know where the journey takes you. So, so walk us through your experience there. Cause I mean, I think you've got, you know, you've had some great stops along the way. Yeah. Um, you know, you start, start with where you went to school. You're from Florida, right? Yeah, I've been in Florida most of my, my life. And I have connections to, uh, three of the greatest universities in the country between UCF, Miami and Florida. And that's, I always kind of start there cause I always wanted to go and be a Gator I got my broadcast degree. I worked in the athletic department there for three years uh, and, and learned everything about college athletics as an intern and took a job, a retail job at a small sporting goods company for a while to pay the bills. But I was like a stats nerd before analytics was cool. So I did a lot of statistics with the visiting networks coming in and got pretty proficient at it and was able to keep my day job, but then also work on the weekends and moonlight as a statistician for literally all the networks. And then I signed a five-year deal with Turner. So I'm watching these basketball games now on TV with the NBA coming back. And I used to literally sit at mid court uh, for games. I mean, and I had the expansion franchises, Miami, Orlando, Charlotte, I guess they gave me New Jersey because no one wanted to go there. <laughs> and it was great, but I'd sit at mid court and get paid money. I was young, traveling all over places, a lot of fun. And that's really, I fell in love with the game of basketball and doing that. But then I kind of made a little pivot. Like we talk about these little changes in life and I wanted to really get in full time in the sports world and get out of retail. And uh, so I went to work for a small minor league basketball league called the Continental Basketball Association, which is what the the G League is now. And at the time they were independently owned franchises, not under the NBA. So the NBA would pay the league a million dollars, the league owners, and then we, we, the league staff, would run the league. And I had sponsorships, marketing, television, and merchandise. So it was, I mean, I cut in our teeth. I didn't really know that much about merchandising at the time, even though I was in retail. But direct mail merchandising and stuffing T-shirts and, and got to travel all over the Midwest a lot. Really enjoyed it. Some of those owners were a little crazy. Uh, a little? So, <laughs> Come yeah. On. Yeah, so I know this, I know podcasts are off, often about storytelling, but before I, I I tell you about my happy road back to Miami and the University of Miami, my last event at the CBA, we were broadcasting the, the tape delay of a CBA game because back then ESPN didn't have a lot of content, so the tape delay game would come on at eleven thirty, and it was a championship game, of uh, the CBA. And we were paying all the costs of production and everything. They would just cover it and put it up on the bird. Well, it was my last event. And I had, because of the way ESPN demanded it, we had to move the game from um, a Saturday night, which you, having been in operations, you know how important Saturday nights are to your budgets, right? Yeah. And we moved it to Sunday night, which ain't good. And uh, the owner was not happy with me because I was the voice in on back to the team. Hey, we're moving the game time. But I was one foot in, one foot out. It was my last assignment with the league. And so the, I produced the whole game from the truck and the owner would not give me a credential 
because he was mad at me because I moved the game to 1130 and he lost whatever he lost at the time, five, $10,000. And I went to the commissioner. I said, Hey, AV, cause that's my nickname. AV, you know, you can be in Miami in four days. Don't worry about it. Just so I sat in the, in, and we had great town. We had Jerry Tarkanian. Um, Bill Walton was just getting started in broadcasting. Nancy Lieberman and the late, um, uh, uh, Oh, Jim, uh, broadcaster from the Bulls, who's in the ba Basketball Hall of Fame. And so we had great talent, and I'd come out and want to talk to him about, you know, halftime or pregame or whatever. And there was a security guard out right outside the door. The owner had, don't let Alex in the building. He cost me $7,500. Oh, well, man. You know, you've been there. Yeah. And uh, that's those kind of stories just <laughs> build character. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, I spent time four years at the University of Miami doing sponsorships, corporate sales, loved it. You was a great program, and then I was at a presentation somewhere, and Disney offered, uh, came in, they were recruiting for the opening of the Wild World of Sports, and they were trying to get a good combination of Disney people that wanted to go into sports and people that were actually in sports, so they brought a core group of us from outside the space, from cities, municipalities, other colleges, and we just literally inherited a performa and a design and dirt, and just wow. built, uh, built the facility uh, 16 months later was open and it was spent over 20 years or almost 21 years there doing every event possible. We did, I mean, no, not an NBA championship. Who could have ever thought that that was going to be at our place? But we had break spring training, globe trotter games, college basketball, holiday tournaments, men's and women. The Bucks ATP. used to do training camp there too, right? Tampa yeah, the Bucks were there for three or four years. Also, uh, actually the first year the Bucks were there, they won the Super Bowl. Okay. Uh, under Gruden. So, yeah, it was, you know, and then a lot of youth sports and great experience, wonderful talent, great company. Um, don't have any anything but great things to say about the experience. And it afforded my, my family a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. And Disney's just a great company. What and kind of now, stuff now did you seeing do? seeing it there? on TV is interesting. So what's that? Now seeing it on TV, those guys playing in the NBA. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of those guys played – at our AAU. complex, yeah. as, you know, it's 12, 13 year olds for AU. I remember Dwayne Wade, 13 years old, and Otis Mayo, uh, who I think is retired. I think LeBron played there. Yeah. I would venture to say 40, 50 percent of those guys played there. Yao Ming was uh, 15 years old when the first time he came to America to play basketball, and he played at our place. So we we saw some great young talent. Well, it's really funny. Good. I I I heard it might've been LeBron or one of the guys say like, feels like we're at AAU tournament, <laughs> you know, just like the other week. So, exactly. you know, they're all housed there and you uh, at Disney and um, looks like a cool setup. What kind of stuff did you do at uh, the complex there? Well, I, I started off as a marketing manager handling Atlanta Braves spring training and then added the AAU started adding the portfolio and then built the whole team up. Uh, so I had a staff of, at the largest point, over 20, uh, marketing, PR, volunteers, technology, community outreach, and sponsorships, all the kind of external relations aspects of, of the small unit, because we were a small fish in a very, very big pond. And so we ran it ourselves, autonomous, working with our, our brand people to make sure we weren't doing anything out of Disney character, which we never did. And so we ran our own shop. And it was great. And then just built it, grew it, uh, took some hits in the early years, like any other business unit that gets money from Disney. They want you to triple the returns. And you sports and amateur sports, as you well know, yeah. uh, Andrew, it's, it's very, very different. It's, it's scraping nickels together sometimes. The yeah. nickels add up. But uh, uh, Walt Disney World's, uh, you know, scrape $100 bills together and, and do really well. And people love coming back. So it's great experience. And then I was blessed to be the head of, uh, along with a friend in, at ESPN, to do the rebranding. So we were Disney's Wild Sports for 10, 11 years, and then we had this little division called ESPN, said, why don't we do more work together? And we had been doing some work, and we decided to rebrand, bring the two brands together, and it just became a Disney plus ESPN equals that place. And once in a lifetime, to be able to work with both of those brands together to create something that you know, now is credible enough to host the, the NBA playoffs and championships. It's, it's really been humbling. I'm sad. I'm, well, I'm not sad. I'm not in the bubble. I would like to go in there. <laughs> and walk in the, I can't imagine the, our, my former colleagues out there 
you know, whatever. They have to stay as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. But have you noticed watching the games, they're probably averaging between the two teams 20, 25 points a game total over what they used to because they're rested, right? They're eating, they're working out, they're, yeah. they're and then they play, you know, whatever, uh, pickleball or go hit some golf balls and then go, they go to sleep Basically. early. They're not out carousing or anything like that. And so they're, they're rested. All those guys are playing well. Every game 135, 140, you know? Yeah. Wow. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a cool thing. And so I have my own company now here in Orlando and, um, I'm really rolling out, like I said, the podcast, I'm, I'm finishing a book on, um, on, uh, my time at Disney called mouse lessons and a couple other things in the, in the work. So just staying busy. I got two teenagers going to college. So trying to keep them in in line, but it's a great sports for the people who are our audience who's listening. It's not about the journey that we've all been on, you know, because we can all tell stories. It's about the journey that you're hearing that might stir something that motivates you to go do what you want to do and pursue the dream. It's a great career. Uh, You're going to give up a lot of Friday and Saturday nights, but if you love, if you love it and you and you're one of those people who's thinking this is all I want to do, then you have to give it a run. You have to commit to it. You have to work hard, and uh, it's a slow marathon to get to the top. There's a, the industry loses a lot of really good talented people because they don't want to put in the time. Yeah. And and this day and age is different. You know, I want to be the president of the club in five seven years. Sometimes it happens, but that's a very very rare percent. Rare. Right? Yeah. So. So that's my world. That's the story. I'm sticking to it and uh, writing the next chapters as we speak. So what's the, so where's your allegiance college wise? Because I mean, you're, you're the U you've got UCF, you've got university of Florida. How do you pick? Um, well, I'm, I'm loyal to the state of Florida because I think Florida's always had the best football. Um, but I grew up a long suffering Gator. The Gators only became really good when Spurrier showed up. And I went through many of a November where they were always losing. So I grew up with those tears of being seven and one and finishing seven and four because Georgia beat us by 40 in early November. So I pulled for the Gators, but I love, I've got some great friends at Miami. I fell in love with that program and UCF, the, my allegiance is to the NBA program there, the under Dr. Lachek from an academic standpoint. They've done a great job, and they have built the program up. Uh, but uh, being a traditionalist, Miami and Florida have won national championships, and UCF as great a job as they did. Um, that was a great strategic and genius marketing move to call themselves undefeated national champions. But that's just me as a fan, not <laughs> not as an adjunct professor. Right. Uh, but as a fan, that's not a national championship. You know, if you don't go to the Super Bowl, you can't win it. I That's agree. just me. That's just me. Yeah. That's I mine. Agree. And, you know, my UCF fans out there would disagree with me, but, hey, that's what makes sports great. You can have the debate. Yeah. And respect both because they've so, done a great, they did a great job. 0-12, 12-0 in what, two seasons? I mean, unheard of in college uh, football. Right. But they ain't, playing, they ain't playing with the big dogs every single week. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Well, hopefully they get that opportunity and then – there's no question, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a big difference in conferences and, you know, yeah. no, no doubt that was, they've had some special seasons there. Yeah. What, what kind of stuff do you talk about in your, um, you know, classes at UCF? Is it sports specific or? Yeah. So they have, uh, so the, the DeVos MBA program is probably in the top 10 in the country. Fantastic program. Got a good mix of international students, uh, HBCU, and uh, traditional college students that all have a passion for sports. But their twist is really around uh, diversity and inclusion uh, as a result of all the work that uh, our leader, Dr. Lachik, has done. And so they come in there with that, with that interest and commit to that and really differentiate, them, differentiate themselves throughout their career with that. So. We spend a lot of time on that in terms of how they can change sports and change their universities and their athletic departments. We have several kids who are now working in uh, student services, helping the, the next generation of athletes 
but I, my class specifically was event management facility operations. I spent much more time, there was marketing in there because I'm a brand marketing guy, but it's much more about building an event and how do you generate uh, profits from that event? How do you create one? How do you monetize it? And then building, so new buildings. We spent a lot of time studying all the new venues because one of uh, my job afforded me the ability to travel to a lot of different venues, looking at different things. And I've stayed involved in the industry with Sports Business Journal. So I probably have 15 or 20 different venues. I've got just beautiful photos on that I took through my tour and I put them together. Just show the evolution of in the old days, the stadiums, the suites were upstairs in a nose bleach. You can really see it. Well, that doesn't work. Now it's all a court level and mid level. And how did that all change? And what impact did that have on construction? Uh, and then what the buildings look like today. And in the last five years, there's been a tremendous amount of change in buildings. Uh, I can't, I think the next evolution now when LA opens up and, 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 and Vegas opens up, those are going to be really interesting buildings comparing to what's currently today. And that's the cool part. Um, but there was buildings there that lasted 22, 25 years and they were, they were a parking lot two weeks later. Yet the Roman Coliseum's still around, right? Okay, so explain that. Yeah, just, just do another renovation. Yeah, yeah. Have you so, seen the um, the two new stadiums that you mentioned, Vegas? I have, and I have not. I've been seeing the videos and different things like that. Uh, and I know they shut down construction for a while, but uh, that's going to be on my list of to-dos once we get back to normal is get out there and, and check it out. Because every every stadium, every technology is different. The, probably the last one that opened up that I then went to is Little Caesars in Detroit. Detroit, okay. And uh, – owned by the Red Wings family. They built it. You got the Pistons 45 minutes away in Auburn Hills. Can't get a building built. The Pistons come in as a tenant, so there's two tenants. But the whole building's red because of the Red Wings. I mean, it is just head to toe, every seat. And so they had to make some retros to get the teams to be able to work together, which they did. And uh, but what was interesting is they took all the old Joe Lewis NHL cup great cup champion trophies and the, and the, and the uh, banners and they took them and they put them in like an auxiliary hockey rank in the corner. So here you are, all these NHL championship banners that you see like in the Boston right, garden right. Yeah. are in some little uh, convention hall because the construction guys didn't want the new sparkling building to have. What? Yes. That's part of the history. You got to have that yes, in there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, it was, Unusual to see that, but they they hired a guy, which is really the coolest trip. They hired a guy from the uh, museum, the Muhammad Ali Museum in Louisville. And he was a cu museum curator, and he came in and curated everything for both clubs and literally generated like a million digital assets. So everything's digital now. So the show comes in. If you're a Pistons fan, you're seeing Pistons stuff in, in windows and doors and and sweet walls change change the colors and storylines so very flexible and but yeah i i saw those championship banners up there and i went man you got to kind of figure out how to <laughs> like keep how did somebody that. let that happen i mean come on you got to see that when you're at the game yeah and all those red seats you know there were some there were some games where they're empty seats and they look terrible on television so then they had to pull out i think almost half of them to a different tone so at least it looked checkerboard-ish where the people live, but that was before modern age started creating phantom fans in the stands and cutouts, right? <laughs> now, we should have done that. It'd been a lot cheaper than pulling out all the seats. That's probably what they're thinking now. Yeah, no, that, uh, that is crazy. I think when I saw that, that arena has just a ton of premium areas too, doesn't it? And especially kind of like you talked about the evolution of it from, you know, the upper, upper level was the sweet, you know, rim. And now it's all getting closer to the court and the ice. But I remember it's, it's almost like hard rock um, stadium. If you've been down there since they renovated with yeah. that lower level is like almost all, you know, they have so much premium in there, bigger yeah. seats, yeah. you know, higher dollars. I think it's uh, – I, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, how are we going to get all those people back 
paying for tickets to sit in seats and because being a great sold out game packed stadium of 75,000 people elbow to elbow that's the experience yeah 20,000 is not gonna be in three levels deep elbow to elbow on both fairways and the guys getting a golf ball straight down the middle that's an experience yeah and how long before everyone in the sports fans comfortable doing that especially as they is that especially as all the people are doing now, which is the right thing to do, staying connected to the sports fan via technology. Now, if you if you connect with them and they get comfortable with that, and now you got to go into the stadium and you're not connected the same way, yeah. it, it's just like an evolution. I don't know what – I don't think anybody really knows where it's all going to end up because uh, I can't imagine basketball. The NBA has done an unbelievable job. Their uh, setup is pretty cool. I they've, mean, done, they've done an incredible job. One, no one's been gotten sick. Yep. Two, the audio that which I was reading about the other day in Venue Now magazine, they said they brought the the home audio in from every team. So they went to those twenty two teams and said, "Give me your audio package, your music, your intro." Right, yeah. uh, yep. in, in, and so they had all. So that would be like a home game, so to speak, yeah. for the team even to the point of having the Miami announcer with the two minute warning coming out and says, dos minutos, dos minutos until halftime. Right. <laughs> Which you can, you can, you can pull that off in South Florida. Right. And uh, so I thought that was pretty ingenious, but they've done an unbelievable job. Every time I watch it, I see something that I've not seen before, but uh, it's, it's well, definitely. I, different. I didn't even realize like, I mean, it's just, it's a simple thing and they've been probably doing it for years, but the logos on the courts, I thought yeah. they were just probably decals put on there, but it's all digital. It's all digital. And it's specific to that home team. Cause exactly. that's the inventory. Yeah. Which, it says their home arena or whatever, Yeah, which is, which is unusual because most of those networks would not give the teams any local inventory, right? They wouldn't, they'd have their national spots and they, but they would put, uh, you know, uh, say you had a hamburger shop, you know, Haynes hamburgers on at, at midcourt, but now that's the only thing that sponsor has and the teams had nothing. So it's been a lot more flexible in terms of how they negotiated. I, I think Adam Silver as a commissioner slash leader is he learned a lot from David Stern, but he was, he's David Stern on steroids mm -hmm. in terms of being uh, very accommodating to the players, the players association He's done a lot with uh, diversity hiring, both in the WNBA and the NBA. And he, he dealt with the whole uh, issue and, and with the Clippers. And the guy just listens. And smart people listen, man. Mm -hmm. Smart people listen. It just you can, you can learn a lot from a lot of different people. And that's, that's one of the great things of being at Disney. There were so many intelligent, really, really smart people there that you walk in your room and – these, these people would just be just, what? I mean, it just helps elevate you even more. I mean, oh, yeah. You, know, you, you, you get smarter just by listening, right? I yep. mean, that's just uh, – and the heritage of the company, that was, that's incredible. Uh, I live really close to ESPN's yeah. sports, the wide world of sports. So, I live like – I was in celebration. I'm in reunion now. Yeah. So. Yeah, the Braves used to play a lot of golf over reunion when they were yeah. there. Moltz and Maddox and those guys. But so, uh, have you watched any baseball? Like, see, I can't, I don't know. I don't know if it's maybe because I'm more of a basketball fan, but yeah. I can watch the NBA games with the way they're structured. I just cannot get into baseball. Yeah. Uh, or I haven't even been able to get into hockey yet, but um, definitely baseball. I couldn't, I couldn't watch a whole inning. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't watch much baseball. Um, and even golf, which I love. I watch golf when the tier one players are playing. Yeah. Because they're just, they just, they're like stars. And that's what the NBA, NBA is just so deep with those stars that you'll watch Westbrook and Harden play against, you know, the 21 year old from Dallas uh, who's, you know, scored 44 points last night in his first playoff game, the highest ever. And, so you watch those individual talents. It's like watching, going to a movie to go see Tom Cruise or something. And in baseball, I just don't see that same star 
uh, draw, and maybe it's because I don't watch baseball all the time. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not watching very much baseball. I watch I, I don't watch soccer. Uh, and soccer was at Disney too, right? Yeah, and they did a nice job with the audio. They did a great tribute to Black Lives Matter. Um, they've now gone back to their communities, and they've got that up and running again, but there's not going to be any fans in the stands. The ratings were, I think, just about average of what they would ex have expected. So they hadn't gotten the pop that uh, golf has gotten and the NBA has gotten. But the one thing we haven't talked about on this one is is college football. What's going to happen with all that? What do you think? Being being here in Orlando, that's I'll tell you what it's it's crazy. I mean, you know, you, the NCAA says there's no champion this year. You know, the SEC is hell bent on playing, and I I saw some stuff with. Uh, you know, Ohio state and a few others that are like, this is, you know, BS, we need to play, um, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's tough. I mean, you know, I think, I think the problem is everybody gets is so worried about liability and, and they're not going to say it. They're going to sit here and say, it's all about the wellness and health of everybody. They care about liability at the end of the yeah. day. And, you know, they're worried that somebody's going to come out there, fan or player, get sick, die, blame them, they get sued, they get bad PR. That's my personal opinion. I think all these leagues out there are worried about the liability first. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be because you don't want to get sued, but they never say it. They just – they want to say the politically correct thing and, um, you know, so – until somebody kind of puts their foot forward and just does it. It's like when the NBA shut down, I was watching the game and I was like, you know, at the time I was working for the Washington nationals, minor league baseball uh, affiliate. Yeah. And I was like, this is going to shut everything down tomorrow. Yeah. And within 48 hours, everything pretty I mean, much got yeah. shut down. They, everybody's following the lead of the NBA. And I think, I think the NBA is probably the best league out there, in my opinion, just no overall. Yeah. And, you know, nobody was really going to come back until they made announcements. And um, I think the same thing with college football. I think, you know, the SEC or any of the leagues that are going to play, they have to just stay firm on it and and make it happen. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I wish teams would just – get back. And I don't know if there's waivers or, you know, just like baseball, NFL, everybody's it's, it's optional. If you don't feel safe as a player, it's okay. You don't have to play. Right. Um, but it's tough. I mean, cause you can't play in the spring. I mean, think about that. You play in the spring, how many guys are going to sit out because of the draft? They're not going to want to, you know, do something then. Right. So, yeah, I, I think liability, I think you're right. And I think it even goes past the conferences. I think the the presidents don't want to have that on their on their dime or their time. And yeah, it's all, it's let's all play it safe. Yeah, so it's, you know, if you got, what I would say you have, I don't know how many uh, college football players are. Say there's 50,000 college football players and you and you run in numbers and 100, and 100 kids pass away. That's not what that's not the headline that any school or sport program wants to have the other thing i think is an issue which makes it really even more complex to get done is there is no one one in college football in in the nba it's the players and and commissioner silver and uh the mls is, is don garber in in college football it's not even the ncaa because they just handle legislation it's the college football playoff system. It's the power of the commissioners. It's the group of five versus the power five versus all the other divisions. Uh, and and uh, the whole um, name, image, and likeness issue is now made even more complex. So there is no one place to go to have a vote that's equal across the board. Every conference has their own uh, agendas. And that's the difficult part about the whole thing is and, and until that gets resolved 
I don't think there is a resolution. I, I think the, the ones that are remaining, ACC, SEC, uh, and uh, the uh, Big 12, I think are the only really things that are legitimately left outside of a, maybe a Conference USA or or American or something like that, and, you know, the next level down. But they're just hanging on to figure out if they can pull it off because that will then create a lot of movement. And ultimately that movement will generate a new model of some type. I don't know what it is. Has, uh, U has UCF come out and said what they, you know, their plans are? No, I mean, I, I don't uh, – I, I, I just read what the UCF officials put out there. They, they don't really know when their first game is. They lost two games because of the, of the, uh, the ACC saying that they weren't going to play non-conference games. So they lost two of their big money games, one road and one home. And I know Danny and his team are great fundraisers and they've done a great job building the program from a fans following perspective that they want, they've been telling the fans, just be patient. We're going to let you know, but I don't think of, they have a first game. It's probably not going to be till like mid October, I think. Wow. And, uh, so they may lose. They've lost a couple early games. But yeah, it's it's just uh, just so many issues with it. I, uh, years and years and years ago, before ESPN, before there was TV on all the time, there was a. Uh, if you remember, college football only had one game of the week. And it was usually a Big Ten team playing Notre Dame or USC playing Notre Dame or or an SEC school playing somebody, Georgia, Florida, or whatever. And that was it. And then Oklahoma and Georgia got together and sued uh, at the time. I'm not sure where in the ownership structure. I think it was the NCAA still controlled television. They sued them and they went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, you're – you're, uh, you're, this is an antitrust violation. You're pulling, these schools want to make money and you're telling them they can't. So they won the court case and then the floodgates opened and now you see every game on. Yeah. And that was 1984. I remember that day because I wrote a paper on it for my graduation. Uh, you know, typical sports guy, you got to do a paper. <laughs> well, what do I want to talk about? Oh, I'll do a sports paper. That'll work. <laughs> but it just happened to be, it was just as a hot topic. And uh, I was really interested in it. And that was 1984, a long time ago. But I think it's going to take that kind of a landmark shift uh, for college football to really land on their feet. Uh, too many bowl games, in my opinion. I don't know about you, but I don't you want – Yeah, the, it's like you, you have bowl games for teams that aren't even 500. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, goody just... powder, the goody powder of, uh, championship game on Tuesday night, just – that's not a tune-in on my dial. No, it's it's. I, I don't. I guess there's money out there though. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, yeah. somebody's making money, so I don't. I just you you watch some of those games and there the attendance is is next to nothing because you have two or three tier teams in there. They're not, uh, you know, they don't have good followings even you know at the college you know from home games. Right. So yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely uh, a lot. I mean. You know, I just think they got to – the SEC probably has the most power there to just, you know, they just – if they can make it happen, um, you know, I think it'll it'll push some of these other teams or leagues that are on the fence. But the challenge is then what do you do? Is there – you know, how do you award the champion? You know, is it only – is the SEC champion the champion this year? like UCF was, I mean, you know, that's a little different because whoever's willing to play, uh, can teams play like yeah. big 10 teams or whatever? Can, can they play even if their league doesn't play? Yeah. It's just, it's just so many, so many, uh, so many issues. So tell me about your audience. What is your audience telling you they enjoy the best? I know you've been very successful with your free agent nation Fridays and uh, kudos if you're listening out there. You got to get on that part of the show because uh, Andrew's telling me earlier he, he's uh, he's hooked up about 10, 12 people for jobs on there. So if you're a free agent, you got to get on that show, man. You got to get them in, right? Yeah, no, that's that's been a good one. I mean, just because, you know, they could throw the video in with a cover letter or, you know, they apply yeah. to a job, they send me a little note, I'll send it to the the HR person or 
if I'm connected to them. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just been a kind of a, a good way to try to help some people who are kind of down and out right now. And they're down and out, not due to then anything they did. I mean, yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. And so anything I can do, um, when I started, it's like, man, I thought there was a lot of people out of work. Well, just in the last week or two, I've, I've seen, you know, probably another thousand plus people yeah. lose their jobs in sports. So, yeah. But, uh, but I think, you know, one thing that's unique about this space because it's so, it's so close knit and everybody uh, changes teams and functions and roles and things. I think it's a very close knit that everyone wants to help each other. Definitely. Cause if you see that, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of people and, and I do it, you know, kind of more independently, but I, people call me up and go, Hey, can I talk to you about my resume? Would you look at my resume? Can, can you help me? How, how's my job search? How's that working? And absolutely. People helped us. I helped you. Yep. And uh, that's what this industry has. I think more than any others, they want to help because they realize how much passion there is and ultimately how much talent there is and inevitably how much talent drain there's going to be from this because there's going to be a really, really, smart group of people that are going to be able to pivot to something else and really transform probably out of, out of the industry. Yeah. And, but they could transform under in other industries as a result of what they've learned in the world mm -hmm. of sports. Uh, yeah, so no. it's for Absolutely. people who are listening, it's a great career. Uh, people are out here to help you. Uh, I think what you're doing for free agent Friday is fantastic. Have you ever read the book free agent nation by Daniel Pink? No. Nope. I'll check it out though. It's a little older, so it does, it's not it's not swamped with all of the internet stuff. Mm -hmm. It's maybe a little right before the internet and everything launched, but it's a really good wisdom filled book on his predictions for the future of a world that is a free agent nation. And ironically, we're all living that right now. Wow. He's written some other books, but he's he's a very good writer and very smart at what he does. Uh, so he wrote one called the Free Agent Nation, which he wrote. Uh, maybe 15 years ago. It's, it's one of my favorites. Check it out. I'd, I'd like to pick up some new books. So that one will be a good one. I, I, you know, I'm 41 now and I just, at this stage of my life, I want to learn more than probably I've ever wanted to learn. So it's like, you know, before I wouldn't really be into it, but now yeah. it's like, I just constantly want to soak up as much as I can and chat with people like yourself who have been successful throughout your career and you know, just learn as much as I can. So. Yeah. Well, that's why I tell my students 50% when you graduate college, at least today, 50% of what you know is obsolete within five years, platforms, technologies, ways of doing business. Yeah. It uh, flies. And, and all of a sudden if, if you don't keep learning and you got 50% of the knowledge in five years, you're not really doing real well. So. Uh, I've always prided myself on being a lifelong learner. I read a ton uh, and, um, uh, you know, listen to a lot of podcasts. What's your favorite podcast you listen to? Do you, do you have any favorites that you I share? I wouldn't say about? I really have a favorite, but I try to listen. I listen a lot to um, other people in the sports business just because, again, I'm fascinated with the industry. But, I mean, I listen to, like um, – uh, Gary V, you know, sometimes, yeah. um, there's a couple others like that, that are kind of outside the space, but just, they have, you know, good, good stuff from a creative and just general business. Um, I really enjoy like interviews with, you know, just entrepreneurs. Yeah. Just, you know, learning and, and seeing their failures and how they overcame them and, um, especially, you know, self-made, you know, people, you know, who've had to grind it out. Yeah. Yeah. You can, everybody's got something to share and is willing to share it. Tim Ferriss is one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, he wrote a book called tools of Titans and he interviews the cream of the crop 1% of people. And he talks about all the same things. How'd you get started? Who had an influence on you? Uh, how do you learn? What do you read? How do you stay motivated? All those things really apply to everybody in one way, shape, or form. Um, so I highly recommend that one. One of my favorite ones, if you can, listen to – he's interviewed uh, Coach George Raveling. 
a couple times, and George was uh, Coach Raveling was the first African American basketball player at Princeton, and wound up coaching the USA basketball team, and was raised by his grandmother uh, in the South. So he's got some great stories about just growing up and all his lessons and learnings and, and what's going on in the world today. So everybody out there, these shows, I mean, now we're all lucky that we get to, we live in this world that if you want to learn something, you can go find out and learn it. Plenty. Yeah. You could soak uh, up a ton. Uh, they used to talk about the 10,000 hour rule before you became an expert. I think if you go all in on a topic, and, and just focus on one thing. I think in two, three months, you can, pr- you can sound pretty damn smart about what you're talking about, right? <laughs> you can. Uh, it. If you don't know something, it's pretty eagle. You go to the, easy. You go to the Google machine and you type in the question. And yeah, yeah. usually you can get an answer. Yeah. And so, and then what, how do you take action from there? So I think what you're doing for your audience is fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to listen to one of those free agent Fridays and see uh, what's coming through the pipeline. Because uh, yeah. I always like to hear good successful stories and um you know we're all living in a very strange time and just keep you got to be a lifelong learner gotta keep learning never ends yeah never ends yep no well i appreciate you joining me um alex it was fun chatting with you um you know i definitely want to um stay in touch and you know, hopefully uh, come out there to UCF. Maybe I'll go back. Maybe I'll go to school. I never went to college. So maybe I'll start taking some classes. I've been thinking about that too. There you go. Taking some classes, but um, no, since we're, we're I not, just happen to have, I just happen to have a book here. Julia Cameron, one of my favorite writers, okay. the title. It's never too late to begin again. Right. Nice. So now, you know, there's people getting degrees at 75 years old, man. You know, it's just about learning, and that's life. That's the best part about it is if you want to learn something, you can learn it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was one of the best things about Disney's every day was a PhD. Every day was a PhD because you, you know, it's such a big company, movies and uh, theme parks and merchandise and television networks. So you, all those things coming at you would learn about those industries, even though you weren't in the core of it. And it really was uh, entertainment. It was a, it was a PhD for twenty years, and, and really really loved it. It's a great place. Well, they've got great talent too. So I mean, you're you're surrounded, like we said earlier, by just brilliant people, and it just all that factors in, you know. Better bring your A game. Yeah. Every day, hey, two things: bring your A game, and the guest is first and foremost in every decision you make, always. The guests know more about the products than a lot of Disney people do. They would call you up and go, um, hey, what about this? And go, I don't know that. I'll have to check on that. And they know it. They come in knowing (laughs) because that's their their Disney files for life. And that's what's so unique about that company. And they'll come back. They'll come back stronger than ever. They'll innovate. People or everybody talks about when the world, when people start coming back to Disney, the world's back to normal. Yeah. No, that's just what will happen. So. But uh, well, good luck. I'll keep an eye on your show. I'll listen to uh, Freed's on Friday, you know, got the next couple, and see what's going on. And maybe I'll do a call in or something. And so, continue Sounds success, good. man. Keep paying it forward. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks.